Today we continue in the sermon series for Lent called Questioning God. And the previous two messages have been about honest questions. The, question, the uh, sermon last Sunday was called Hard Questions, and if you missed either of those, would like to listen to them, they are available on the website at trinityumchurch.org. Today's message, part three, is called Heart Questions. Heart Questions. Questions and we start with a gospel lesson from Mark chapter 12. If you would turn there in your Bibles, I would greatly appreciate that. If you didn't bring your own, there are pew Bibles all uh, through the sanctuary, and we will put the words on the screen as well. This is an encounter that someone had with Jesus described in Mark chapter 12, starting at verse 28. This is the written word of God. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no one besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, He said to them, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Pray with me, please. Holy Spirit, without your help, we cannot understand your word. We can't hear what you're saying, and we can't understand at all what it is that you're asking of us or the good things you're giving to us. So now, Lord, come and speak to us as we read your word, as we study it, and as we open our hearts to it, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. This message is called Heart Questions because our questions often reveal our heart. The type of questions we ask, the kind of questions they ask, and the direction in which they are headed usually reveal what's in our heart. Today, Mark's description includes an exchange Jesus had with a scribe, a scribe who asks him, what is the most important commandment, Lord? And the scripture says uh, that Jesus answered him well, but this man asked Jesus to get to the point, didn't he? What's the point of it all, Jesus? What's the most important part of that? His question shows that he wants Jesus to lead him somewhere. Good teachers know that you get lots of questions like this. What is the least I can do to get by, to pass this class? Or you might have one who will ask, what do I have to do to get an A? There are other students you know about who aren't just there for a grade or aren't just there to pass but who really want to grasp the material. They want to know the subject well enough to make it his or her own. One of the greatest gifts I have received in my life is I have received, at many different places, a great education. I can still name for you every one of my elementary teachers. And that's been a day or two ago. Because... All along the line, in elementary school and middle school and high school and college and postgraduate, I have been blessed to be around some great teachers. When I was in college, I studied World War II under a man who had been drafted by the Hitler Youth at the age of 12 or 13 and who escaped Germany with his family. When that guy taught World War II, you listened to him. There were things that I learned from him that you can't learn in a book. The other thing I had were great teachers who taught not just 
facts and dates and figures and data. But I had teachers who taught me how to think and how to live my life so that as things changed after I left school, that I would be able to learn on my own and to learn in a world after school. Some of you may find this hard to believe, but in none of my schooling until I went for my doctorate was there a computer involved. Nowhere. To seminary, I carried an IBM typewriter that weighed about as much as my car did. It was made out of cast iron. And yet, the education I got from those good teachers at every different level taught me how to live in a world and learn in a world and continue to learn even beyond what they had taught me because they taught me how to use my mind and how to use my spirit and how to continue to learn all the days of my life. Does anybody understand what I just said? Jesus has this encounter with a scribe And he really wants to cut to the heart of the matter, doesn't he? He says, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Now, by the way, how long is the Old Testament? There's some stuff in there. 39 books as we have it now. Lots of stuff, especially Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Lots of material there. And how many of you have ever heard someone ask a question and they do a little tap dance? They dance around it and don't answer. Jesus did not do that, did he? It says that Jesus answered well. He came right to the heart of the matter. He was able to give an answer of all that he had learned and all that he had heard in the synagogue growing up, of all the times he had been around rabbis and was now called rabbi himself. He was able to give this answer. He said the first of the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Any Jew listening to that, knew that was the Shema from Deuteronomy 6.4. Shema is the sound that the Hebrew made when you started to repeat that, the Shema. The first of the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That made Israel very different in the Middle East. There were all the polytheistic religions and the multiple religions. God had called Israel to know that there was one God and one God only. And it goes on to say in You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. He said, this is the first commandment. And then the second one he said, he quoted Leviticus 19. And there's a section that ends by saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus, having grasped the material well enough, knew to go to these two disparate points and to bring them together to give us what would be the heart of the New Testament, isn't it? Isn't that what we still memorize? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We still to this day understand that that is the heart of the gospel, isn't it? Love God and love neighbor. We can shorten it to that even. Love God and love neighbor. That is the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he saw it in the Old Testament. Knew it well enough had mastered it well enough that he could answer without a tap dance. You ever heard anybody give an answer to where they're just going homina, homina, homina and never answer the question? Give lots of words, lots of material. Jesus didn't do that, did he? He knew exactly what to quote, where to point to. He knew the material and he had mastered it well. The scribe Here's Jesus say this, and the scribe affirms what Jesus has said. He said, well said, teacher. You've spoken the truth. There is one God, no other but He. And we're to love Him with our heart and our understanding and our soul and our strength. And all of that is worth more than all of our burnt offerings. And then Jesus says in verse 34 something very interesting. He says to the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but I would love to have Jesus say that to me. Wouldn't that be awesome? If Jesus looked at what was in our life and said, you know what, you're not far from the kingdom of God right there. This is very unusual too, because if you go on in Mark 12, a few verses later, he has some other things to say about scribes that are not nearly as complimentary. 
So for Jesus to look at this one and say, you're not far from the kingdom of God is truly an affirmation. So the scribe and Jesus affirm each other, a very unusual thing. Today we're talking about heart questions. Questions of the heart. Jesus condemns the scribes in a few verses, but in this exchange, he sees and he hears in this scribe someone who really does want to know something, who wants to know what the heart of the matter is. The scribe's question and Jesus' response reveals both of their hearts. And when they hear each other, and when they talk with each other, there is an exchange of hearts. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about turning hearts toward God, isn't it? You'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The questions that flow out of our hearts are important. They reveal who we are and guide who we become. There's one other scripture I'd like you to pay attention to today. It's Proverbs 4.23. In the ESV, in this Bible that we use in the sanctuary, this is what it says. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Would you mind reading that off the screen with me, please? Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. That's a pretty good version of it. I think there's a better one. In the NIV, it says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Another translation says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Have you ever thought about the need to guard your heart? Your heart is precious, and you should guard it, you should protect it, you should be careful of what it is that you allow to influence that heart. When someone is a new believer, one of the things that we can advise them to do is to change the things that are surrounding you. When you become a follower of Jesus, for instance, I recommend things like, do any of you listen to Christian radio during the week? Um, Do any of you listen to Christian music? We do that because we say you want to have your heart surrounded by those things that will lead you toward God. Now let me ask the opposite question. Have any of you ever changed what you were watching on television because you thought it just wasn't good for you? I have a lot of parents tell me they took that off the television because it's not good for kids. I said, is it any good for you? Don't blame it on the kids. The chances are real good if you don't want your kids to see it, you shouldn't be seeing it either. Anybody understand what I just said? Those of you who are married, it is important that you guard your heart in your relationship with your spouse, is it not? Because you and I can find our place in compromising situations, can't we? And sometimes it's the better part of wisdom to say, you know what, I need to remove myself from that situation. Somebody who's flirting at work. When we moved to Southern Maryland, yeah, I guess I can do this, (laughs) especially since we're live on the internet now, I always stop and think. When we moved to Southern Maryland, someone who had known me as a teenager wanted to know if I would like to get together I said, I don't think that's a good idea. And she began to theorize about different illnesses that might strike Mrs. Swecker in the days to come and her availability if that were to happen. Now, first of all, she has several screws loose, doesn't she? And if you're watching this, and you may be, I hope you got help. If you don't, let me know because I'll help you find help. I, though, however, told my wife immediately about her and that I was blocking 
all contact with her through social media, through the internet. Do any of you understand what I'm saying right now? Because that just was not a good communication of any kind. Those of you who work outside the home and some of you who work inside the home, you've had situations at work, haven't you, that are just not good for your marriage. And if you were wise, you would guard your heart. And you would move yourself away from something that's not good for your marriage. How many of you have ever changed the channel on television or radio because you said, that's just not good for me? And the closer you get to Jesus Christ, by the way, things that used to not bother you will start to bother you. In fact, you'll have some of your friends say, I don't understand why you're making a big deal. What does it hurt? But something inside of you, and that's something, by the way, is the Holy Spirit tells you that there's danger there and that there's something going on there that God does not want to happen. The Bible says, guard your heart. And this is not just for married people, but all persons. There are things that come along, folks who will offer us things, folks who will want us to do things and think things and support things that are not in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Your heart and where it's tuned and who it loves and who it seeks will determine the steps of your life, will it not? Those of you who've been married longer than 30 minutes, have you ever been unhappy with your spouse? We're about to have confession right before communion, so <laughs> do it if you want. I have couples all the time come into my office, they hold hands on a little love seat, and I say, what do you do when you disagree? And they say, oh, we don't disagree. We just hold hands and look into each other's eyes. I think, boy, I got two big fools on the line this morning. Oh, my gosh. Woo! They have a long way down to come. Hey, no matter what it is that's going on, no matter what offer is made, no matter what opportunities avail themselves to you, no matter what it is the world calls, God's Word says, guard your heart above all else, for in it determines the course of your life. We're about to issue an invitation to the Lord's Supper. That invitation is open. It's open to everyone here. And one of the things we hope you'll do is to open your heart to Christ. You don't have to be a member of the church. You don't have to have been baptized. You don't have to have any sort of credentials. The only thing we ask is that you would open your heart to Christ. Receive the invitation to come to the Lord's Supper because you've heard Him call and you want to eat with Him and with His people. You want to be at His table. Let's open our hearts to the One who makes a difference. Are you in love with Jesus Christ? See, we ask that question in a different way about different things, don't we? But the main place I want to end is this. Are you in love with Jesus Christ? Are your hearts tuned to Him? How many of you have ever heard a guitar player tune his guitar? Or her guitar? And usually, I believe, musicians, you have to have something to compare it to. You have something that tells you what true pitch is. What do we have to compare true pitch? We have Jesus Christ Himself and we have His Word, don't we? And every time we get together, we're tuning our hearts, aren't we? To true pitch. To have our hearts in tune with Him. It's not an easy thing to do, is it? Sometimes it's way out there. But if you and I will guard our hearts, the one who will keep us in tune will meet us there. 
and will help us with that. Pray with me if you would, please. Lord, thank you for helping to tune our hearts to you. Lord, if there'd be anybody listening to this this morning who wants to start a relationship with you, God, wants to be in tune with you, let this be the day of salvation. Let this be the day that we start walking with you and turn our hearts over to you. Unlock that lock on it and let you in. Let you be the one, Lord, who directs our hearts. Help us to guard them jealously and above all else so that we might remain in love with you and love our neighbor all the days of our lives, we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.